I'm Bruce Fumey. Whether you're interested in Scottish clans and monarchs, Jacobites, or British history in general, you can't fail to have noticed the Stuarts. Of course, the fall of the Royal House of Stuart came because of a struggle for the English throne in the late 17th century. But did it occur to you that the rise of Clan Stuart, the Stuart monarchy of Scotland, and hence England, started with a fight for the English crown 500 years earlier? Sound intriguing? Then this is the video for you. If you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right hand side of the screen. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. You may think of the Stuart dynasty as tragic. In fact, on this channel, you'll find videos where I describe the tragedies of James I, James III, James IV, Mary Queen of Scots, Charles I and of course, the demise of the Stuarts and the Jacobite cause. At the end of this video, I'll leave a link to a playlist with some of those videos. The thing is that there'll be hours of video on this and other channels about how the Stuart dynasty ended, but little about how it began. And that's why today I've brought you to Dundonald Castle, just outside Kilmarnock in Ayrshire. Later, it'll be obvious why the seat of early Stuart authority was in this area. But this is the castle that Robert II had built for himself when he became the first Stuart King. Come with me. Robert II is one of the Scottish monarchs from whom people most often tell me that they're descended. Now that's maybe not entirely surprising, given that he's said to have had 21 children. 21! Nine by his first wife, whose marriage to him was questioned because it was a wee bit too... Well... Let's just say nine children, 108 fingers. You get me? No? There are still people in Alabama, Norfolk and Fife wondering why it's only them that can count the 12 times table on their fingers. Anyway, he had loads of illegitimate children too. In fact, I'd be tempted to ask, if you're not descended from Robert II, what was your 18 times great granny up to? It's the children from Robert's second marriage that would lead to the conflict around the throne for the next two generations, and of course, the future Stuart kings of Scotland, thus of England, and finally, very briefly, the United Kingdom. But how did Robert II become king in the first place? Well, he succeeded David II of Scotland, the son of Robert the Bruce. He died without heirs. <clears throat> now, during the Second War of Scottish Independence, incidentally, I've got some videos on that, the boy king, David II, spent some time in exile in France, and then he was later captured by the English. And during these periods, Robert Stuart, the future Robert II, got to practice the whole being royal thing, looking after the country as regent. As I say, David II died without heirs, and the rest is history which is kind of the whole point of these videos. That and visiting places of interest. This one is run by friends of Dundonald Castle and you should definitely come and visit sometime. Anyway, Robert, Robert II's mum, was Robert the Bruce's daughter, Marjorie. But who was his dad? And how did he get himself married to the daughter of Robert the Bruce? I mean, that must have been the scariest meet the parents experience ever. Imagine you're going out with some girl and she takes you home to meet her dad. And it's Robert the Bruce! What are your intentions, young man? Uh, well, right now, I, I, I was going to just wet my pants and, and then I was going to wing it after that. Actually, it wasn't quite like that. It was the other way round, in fact. Walter, that was the young lad who married Marjorie Bruce and gave us the Stuart line. Walter, the steward, had been a key supporter of Robert the Bruce. He'd fought alongside him at Bannockburn and he'd done other stuff as well. So the marriage arranged with Marjorie Bruce was a kind of reward. That must have been the scariest meet your fiance experience ever. Imagine a marriage has been arranged for you, the days come and gone, you're in that fumbly, awkward first thing, you know, on the wedding night, and you can't even say, who's the daddy? Because it's Robert the Bruce! The truth is that Walter the Steward was used to being around the Scottish royal family. 
he was the high steward of the king. Now what that meant was that he ran the king's household, which presumably meant that the first steward king had to look after his own house. You'd see him down a DIY store, crown on the head, pencil behind his ear, but he'd been used to it. You see, his ancestors had been stewards to the kings of Scots for generations. That's how over the generations, what had been the job title of steward to the king became the family name Stuart. Walter was the sixth of his family to be high steward of Scotland, since King David I made it an hereditary title to Walter's three times great granddad, who coincidentally was also called Walter, Walter Fitzalan. In truth, it's probably not that much of a coincidence. It would be more of a coincidence if he was called Tony, I don't know. Even Tony's not that much of a coincidence. I'll be honest, it was going to be a Chinese name, but whatever I said, it sounded a wee bit racist, so... The point is that a few years after David chose Walter Fitzalan as his steward, he made the title hereditary. In those few years, he obviously decided that not only could Walter Fitzalan get the job for life, but his son would be pretty good at it too. And his grandson, his three times great grandson, all the way down to the present Prince Charles. How crazy is that? Can you imagine if they chose football managers that way? Of course, this wasn't so much skills-based employment as patronage. Oh, incidentally, if you want to become a patron and support this channel, then click the white tab up there. Alternatively, you can support the channel by buying coffee in the description below. Patreon members don't have to put up with those annoying adverts. So, how did Walter Fitzalan get the job of looking after the king's household in the first place? Well, there was a civil war in England. You see, Henry I of England wanted his daughter Matilda to rule after him. But when Henry died, her cousin Stephen of Blois managed to get in before her and have himself crowned king. That led to a civil war that they call the Anarchy. Now, for our international viewers, let's be clear. This was the English Anarchy as opposed to Anarchy in the UK, a seminal punk album by the Sex Pistols. Yeah, it's difficult to say which had more significant effect in British history. They were both very different eras. I'd argue that the grandchildren of William the Conqueror had a bigger impact on the nobility. But the Sex Pistols had a better album cover. Just my opinion. Anyway, not only was Matilda the daughter of Henry I of England, she was also the niece of David I of Scotland. So he came in on her side and invaded England. And Walter Fitzalan was a key supporter of his, and that's why he was rewarded with the title High Steward. The title became hereditary, Stuart became a family name, and of course, the rest is history. I mean, I'll still make a couple of stupid jokes as well, but largely the rest of this will be history. My point is that the Stuart line may have ended with a struggle for the English throne, but it also started with a struggle for the English throne, which has been my premise from the start. Now, most YouTubers would have ended it there with that neat completion of the circle, but you know that's not my style. We can't end it there because we still have to answer the question, how did Walter Fitzalan become an ally to David I and a landowner in Scotland in the first place? As the name suggests, Walter Fitzalan, Walter was the son of a guy called Alan who gained lands in Shropshire. Now, Walter wasn't Alan's eldest son, so he wasn't going to inherit lands. What younger sons had to do was to go away and win their own lands by showing loyalty to some lord or noble elsewhere. Now, David I grew to maturity in the Norman court in England. You see, Henry I's daughter wasn't his niece by accident. No, the King of England was pumping David's sister. There, David rubbed shoulders with the recent French immigrants that had been brought to England as part of the Norman takeover. 
When David I came north to Normanize Scotland, he brought these knights with him as enforcers to impose himself on and control the parts of Scotland where the King's writ didn't quite run. Now, Galloway was still wild and independent at the time. And so David granted the first Robert the Bruce, from whom our warrior king was descended, lands in Annandale to act as a buffer to Galloway. The West Coast and the Hebrides were similarly controlled by the Norse or the Lordship of the Isles. Oh, check out my videos in the Lord of the Isles. So, as a buffer, here in the West, David gave lands in Renfrew, Mearns, Kilmacombe and Ayrshire to Walter Fitzalan. And that's how Walter Fitzalan became a landowner in Scotland in the first place. Now, here's the thing. When David gave these lands to Robert the Bruce, Walter Fitzalan and other French knights, he wasn't really giving them the lands. Essentially, he was given his permission for them to go and take the lands, secure them and control them on David's behalf. Now, I've seen it suggested that the reason that David I gave Walter Fitzalan lands in Strathclyde was because it was the part of Scotland which had been the kingdom of the Britons. Walter was a Breton from Brittany in France. And so he would have a mutual linguistic and cultural understanding with these northern Britons whose language would have been a bit like Welsh. Now, I don't know to what extent that was the motivation, but we do know that Walter Fitzalan's dad, like around 10% of William the Conqueror's invasion force, wasn't Norman, but Breton. And that's where the family had been hereditary stewards to the bishops of Dole, just south of St Malo. Otter's dad, Alan Fitzflad, was brought from Brittany by Henry I and given lands in Shropshire on the border with Wales to do exactly the same job that his son would do here in the west of Scotland a generation later. The thing is, that when we talk about Stuart monarchs, people speak about the Italian fop that was Bonnie Prince Charlie, or his granddad ousted from the throne, or tragic Scots-born monarchs that were beheaded by the English. The patriarch of what we now call the Stuarts was a guy called Alan Fitzflad, who secured land by fighting for it as part of the wave of Norman immigration to England. His son, stepped up to be a major landowner as a warrior immigrant to Scotland. The family remained close to the crown, then acceded to the crown, survived as our nation's longest reigning dynasty before claiming the English crown in what would become the British Empire. Through all, they outlived the English House of Normandy, the House of Blois, the House of Anjou, Plantagenet, Lancastrians, Yorkists and the Tudors. Maybe the Stuarts weren't a tragic dynasty after all. Maybe they were the great survivors. I've put together a playlist of my videos relating to the Stuart monarchs in a chronologically ordered playlist, and you'll find it here. In the meantime, Hamiandoch is going to be a lama alive. Cheerio and Rasta.